Hello, this is Clint May with LIT Ministries, and welcome to Leadership Training Part 1. As we begin the training, you want to make sure that you have a copy of the Leadership Training Guide 2016, and you can get that from your uh, minister or director of LIT and Nehemiah Kids. Let's go through uh, on page 4, uh, and this is our mission statement to empower the next generation. Our goal is to recognize the uniqueness of every child, Reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ, disciple, equip, and release them for ministry in the church and the world. And we're defining children as birth through 18 years of age. One of the things that we're real strong with in LIT are biblical principles. And we have 12 biblical principles, and your director or leader has gone through this. But our number one principle that we uh, adhere to strictly is Christ is the head of the church and it is his vision you're called to fulfill it's the boss principle and so all of our discipleship all of our equipping point to the supremacy of Christ in every believer's life so what we want to do is show you the steps or the process of LIT LIT is not a curriculum uh, it's not a resource it's a process of discipleship and moving kids in a relationship with Jesus Christ where they can grow in their faith and then in order that we can disciple and equip them for ministry in the church. And so starting out, number one is God in church. What is our responsibility is to make disciples and equip the saints for the works of ministry. Number two is family. Family has a calling. And so what we want to do as a church is recognize who we are as a church and our responsibility and our role to make disciples, but also to equip the saints for the works of ministry. And then secondly is family. Third is discipleship equipping process, and we're going to go through that real extensively. Number four is we provide ministry training for children and students, and we also involve them in ministry according to their gifts. Number five is our mission trips. We want to, we're going to take kids on missions and uh, allow them to share the good news of Christ and fully release them in ministry. Number six, we want them by sixth grade, not this year, but the next year, once they hit the sixth grade, and they're solid in their faith, and they understand their relationship with Christ, not a discipline problem, then we allow them to disciple younger kids in the church, first and fourth graders preferably, under the leadership of another adult. And the ultimate goal for LIT is that they would discover their plan and purpose in the body of Christ in the world. All right? So what's the role of the church? Number one is the boss principle. Christ is the head. He's our boss. And the power principle is prayer. Prayer is the ultimate source of power and wisdom and, and vision for your ministry setting and for our ministry setting. And so I want to show us a video to kind of introduce. This is from the 414 Window Movement, and it's called Children, the Great Omission from the Great Commission. Most pastors, most church leaders, most mission leaders, most seminary people know that uh, Jesus had a few things to say about children. He accepted them. He accepted their worship. When he got angry, he was angry at his disciples keeping the children from coming to him. He said, make sure you don't cause any of these little ones to stumble because I tell you, their angels in heaven always see the face of the Father, suggesting that children have angels. He says that if you cause one of these to stumble, you might as well have a millstone tied about your neck and thrown into the deepest part of the sea. Pastors know that. Missionaries know those, those passages. Even seminary professors know those passages, but that's about all they know. They don't know that there's more than 1,400 references, and many of those references have theological significance. Many of them talk about how God uses children to further his kingdom and uses children for his purposes, but it's been ignored. I have in my shelf a book called Christian Theology, and it's a book of about 12 or 1300 pages. And if you go to the index of that book, you look for children, two or three or four references. That's it. Students in seminaries today can get very lofty degrees in their, in their seminary program and never see anything about children. Never see that they're important. Never see how God uses them. Never see how important it is in their future church ministries to know about and affirm children and parenting and that sort of thing. We know about the great commission. The great omission 
is all of these scripture references that are never addressed by our students, by our church leaders, seminary students, and so I call it the great omission. It's a great video. It's going to introduce what we're going to talk about next. On page eight is recognizing the significance of children in the church today. And so this is one of the biblical principles we apply is the Timothy principle. Every believing child has value, a calling, and a purpose in the body of Christ today and in the future. And our problem today is this, the ministry box. The ministry box is the idea that we can set a child in a classroom, make them sit still, and just listen year after year. And we believe that they'll become fully devoted followers of Christ as they grow up in, in this way in the church. And we know it doesn't work. It's basically a, a faith killer. The, the, the definition of children's ministry from LIT's perspective is to recognize the uniqueness of every child. We reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We disciple, equip, and release them for ministry using their gifts in the church and the world. Okay? And so let's look at this chart. God has a plan for every child. The, the, the primary focus today, and, as, and I'm guilty too, for most children's ministry is evangelization of kids. And so Roman 10, Romans 10.9 10, says, If we confess with the mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Well, we don't realize in the church today is Ephesians 1.13 says when they accept Christ, they've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. What we, a lot of times what we do in the church is we, our ultimate goal is to evangelize them, but it stops there. We don't realize that they've been sealed by the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit of promise. They're sealed by him, and they're also gifted by him, by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12.3 says no one can say, Jesus is a Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. And at that point of accepting Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit fills them, and he also gifts them, because after that point, he lists off, the Apostle Paul does, all the different gifts that the church has, okay? And so, what are we going to do with these gifts? Number one, with a child, we're called by Matthew 28, 19, and 20, is to make disciples, but also Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 says some, there are some as apostles, some are prophets, some are pastors and teachers and evangelists for the equipping of the saints for the works of ministry. And so we have two callings as a church is to make disciples, but also equip these younger saints for works of ministry. All right. What's our calling? Number one, to know the spiritual condition of everyone in your group. You cannot disciple someone who's not a disciple, okay? And so we want to make sure that we reach them with the gospel. And that's going to be part of what you do as you begin your disciple group time each week. Number two, disciple them into fully committed believers in Christ. Three, equip the saints, children, for works of ministry in the church and in your group, okay? And that's going to be your calling. On page 13, you need to look at the job descriptions. And I'm not going to read through, through those uh, in order, you can pause the video now and look through that and understand what your role is a, of a disciple group leader is, or also um, look at your responsibility as a leader uh, in the area of discipleship. All right. So you want to make sure you know your job description, your responsibilities. And then from that, we want to go to understand the role of family in the church, okay? Uh, according to our training, we're trying to help the church understand it's a partnership, okay? And so as your, your uh, ministry leader, your ministry director, your director of LIT and NMI kids, they've been taught to help the families understand, and this is going to happen in orientation that a family is not an island. They're not on their own. They're not by themselves. And so we want to. You're gonna. Your goal of your director and your children's pastor is to have the pastor on board, the staff, deacons, elders, if you have them, your leadership. That's you and your church family to know that these families are in a spiritual battle, and we're going to provide protection for those families in order them for them to have the greatest success. Okay. And so well, let's look at the responsibility of parents. Parents are called by their creator to train their child and to transfer their faith to their children. Okay? And the church is going to partner with the families to support the discipleship of their children. Okay? And that's where you're going to come in if you're a small group leader, what we call DG group or disciple group leader. Number two, the church provides resources for families to disciple their children. And that's going to be the daily devotions that the LITs and Nehemiah kids will be taking home. They're going to bring those back to the church. 
The church provides a mentor, that's you, to come alongside the family and disciple their child. All right? Number four, the church provides spiritual support through prayer and accountability. Okay? And so your church is going to be provide a, a prayer covering for this family, for yourself. But also the accountability part comes in as you as a disciple group leader is if you're going to be a disciple or you're going to be responsible to make phone calls weekly to encourage that child, to pray for that family, to encourage that family. And this is not Sunday school. We're going to take this and we're calling it discipleship because you're going to be developing a lifelong relationship with this child. Number five, parents are required to attend parent orientation to understand the discipleship process of the program. So if you know families who are struggling, you want to encourage them to come to the parent orientation so they can fully see and understand the philosophy and process of LIT. And number six, the church provides needed spiritual protection for families when the vision is fully understood, okay? And so we want to be praying. We want to provide a hedge of protection for families who are coming into this ministry because it's going to be a battle for them, okay? Uh, The reason we require parent orientation because not a lot of families today understand their role or even how to disciple their own kids. And so we do a parent orientation to help them understand their role and their responsibility in order that we can help them get on track as far as doing quiet times. The worst thing we can do as a church is pass out devotionals and not explain to families about their personal priorities or how to to help their kids do quiet times or how to memorize scripture. And so parent orientation is real critical to help them understand the philosophy of the ministry, okay? And so here's where you fit in if you're in the disciple group or or small group leadership. Number three is your role is going to disciple. uh, It's going to be to disciple and equip these younger saints, okay? And so, okay, and let's look at this. When we're choosing you as a leader, the role of a disciple is to make disciples who make disciples. They move from a model of Barnabas to Paul to Timothy. This is a process. is repeated continuously, okay? And so here you are. You're going to be like in the Paul or the Paulette position. You've got LITs and Nehemiah kids in the Timothy or Timothette. And then we have a church leader director who's in this role, okay? Your ultimate goal is you're going to be starting out discipling these kids like Paul did. And then you're going to move back to a role where Paul became in like like Barnabas, the son of encouragement, was his nickname. He was in this role. He left Timothy to start churches who put young people under his leadership for responsibility and teaching in the church, okay? And so what we do with Nehemiah kids and LIT is once a, a, six, a, a child or an LIT hits sixth grade, we move into this role, and we have an adult leader in this role, okay? And so ultimate goal is to make disciples who make disciples, Okay. One of the things that are key points of LIT is understanding this is spiritual revelation, okay? And so you as a leader are going to be pushing and encouraging and and taking kids out of their comfort zone to have a walking and loving relationship with Christ. And so spiritual spiritual revelation is a striking or a conscious disclosure of something not before realized about God and his will for the believer in Christ, Okay. And you can find that on page 17. When God puts us to the test, it tests our faith, but it also develops and strengthens our faith. Okay, how many of you have really been pushed out there by the Lord? He has thrown you out of your comfort zone, what we would call thrown into the deep end, and he's stretched you. Okay, secondly, you want to do, and, and what we want to do is we want to do that with kids. Spiritual revelation happens when we put children or students out of their comfort zone in situations where they must rely on God to bring them through. So that's what we want you to learn is in your small as a discipler, you're constantly pushing kids out of their comfort zone. And we're going to tell you how to do that. Number three, spiritual revelation occurs when a child or student is given tasks they to complete that are through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit working in their life. And number four, spiritual revelation occurs when children encounter God through spiritual disciplines of lordship, prayer, Bible study, evangelism, gifts in ministry, and living a life of obedience to Christ, okay? And so your role as a disciple is going to be constantly pushing kids out of their comfort zone. We're going to explain that in just a minute. All right, LIT and the MI kids and also Seesaw, our new curriculum, uses the cross to teach spiritual disciplines and about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when we say spiritual revelation, number one, 
a lot of Christians don't realize that when we say, Jesus, I want you as my Savior, our calling from him is in Luke 9, 23. And it says, if any man come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me daily. Okay? And so, uh, basically, the Christian life is a call to die to self and to lay down our life in full surrender to the Lord. Okay, we want them to be in the Word of God, and we want them to read it, to study it, to memorize it, to meditate upon it, and then we're going to help them put it into practice. What happens in the church today many times is we're here, we believe that we're going to transform kids sitting in a Bible study, listening, sitting quiet, being still for years, uh, and it's not happening, and they're leaving the church. And the reason why is faith is caught, not taught. Remember that, faith is caught, not taught, okay? And so... For their faith to come alive is, I have to put it in action. So if we're going to teach them God's word, we've got to make it come alive by what we do. The next thing is talk with God. And what this means in Jeremiah 33, 3, it's, God says this, Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and unsearchable things which you do not know. And basically, this is we're teaching a the, the horizontal relationship. Let me back up here, sorry. Uh, the vertical relationship, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. If you love the Lord, you'll lay down your life to Him. Romans 12, 1 says that's holy and pleasing. When we surrender to the Lord, we're in His Word, we're talking and we're praying, and, and we're having a loving relationship with Him. That's the vertical relationship. The horizontal relationship is to tell others, and to use. And we have gifts for ministry within the body of Christ, and that's we're to use these gifts to love others. Also, what we understand in spiritual revelation is when we say Jesus Lord, we don't realize that we have to lay down our life for the Lord. That's a revelation. When we read God's word and we study it and we claim its promises, there's a revelation that occurs when we see it come alive. When there's a spiritual revelation, when we pray and God answers, there's a revelation of evangelism when God, the Holy Spirit, infills a child and they share the gospel and people get saved. There's a revelation when they realize that they've been given gifts by the Holy Spirit for ministry in the church. And then the revelation is we're called to obey. And that's the final step. Let's move to the Ezekiel principle, which this is something I love in discipleship. And what and we're going to camp out here just a little bit. Uh, Ephesians, Ezekiel 47, 1 through 5 is a beautiful picture. Uh, Ezekiel standing there looking at the throne of God, and there's water trick, tripling out, trickling out of the side of the temple. It's the temple of God, I'm sorry. And he's standing there, and all of a sudden an angel shows up, and he's got a tape measure, and he measures out a thousand cubits, and he's, he's, uh, he's ankle deep, okay, on the bank first, then he goes ankle deep, then another thousand cubits knee deep, another thousand it's waist deep, another thousand it's swimming, okay? And so what the Lord has shown me through... The Ezekiel principle is this, where we're at today in most churches is as we're on the bank with kids. And we were on the bank for 18 years of life. And so looking at the Ezekiel principle, I do you watch is what's being done in the church today, which is really a faith killer for kids. The ultimate goal for you as a disciple group leader is the first couple of months, you want to find out where everybody's at spiritually. Do they know Jesus? Do they understand who he is? And then we began to assess spiritual gifts, and we moved to the next level. I do, you you help me. Then we go to the next level. You do, I help you. And then the next level, waist deep. You do, I watch. And the ultimate goal is you do, which is when they go on the mission trip, uh, and, and that's the ultimate goal of LIT is moving them from the church into the community and into the world, okay? And so the mission trip is swimming because when we send them out on these mission trips with LIT, they do all the teaching, they lead all the songs, and God connects with their heart, and they do amazing things for the Lord. All right? So let's look at what we want to do for phase one of the Ezekiel principle in your book. And let's look at this right now. Number one, model the Christian faith. Be an imitator of me just as I also am of Christ, is what Paul said. Secondly, be fully submitted to the Lordship of Christ in your life. And this is what's expected of a disciple group leader, okay? You're doing daddy quiet times. And so you can bring your book to class for this first month or first two months, and you show them that you've been doing your quiet time. Fourth, you're memorizing Scripture. Don't ask kids to do something that you're not doing, okay? And so you are got to be memorizing Scripture 
in order to present that to the kids, showing them what you've been doing yourself. Five, you faithfully serve in the body of Christ, and that's what you're doing as a disciple group leader, but you have other roles in the church as well. You do everything for your group. You teach, you lead in prayer, you memorize scripture, you, have, you hold them accountable, ask them to do it as well. They should be doing their Bible, Bible studies and memorizing scripture. They should pray along with you. And then you regularly attend worship as well as invite the kids to do the same thing. So basically, you're like Paul. You're being a mentor, a model for what these kids are doing. Okay? You teach them, and they observe you. And so it's basically, I do watch this whole first month or two months until you find out where they're at spiritually. Okay? Number nine, you should determine the spiritual condition of your group, who knows Christ and who does not. Okay? And so this is really important to understand that you need to know where everybody's at in their, in their spiritual condition. And you can find that in your book, the ABC Counseling Card, How to Lead Someone to Christ. You can highlight your Bible. It shows you how to give an invitation and how to counsel kids. And so your ultimate goal this first month or two months is to know where everybody's at in your group spiritually. Okay? Let me show you something here that uh, through my research in seminary, uh, that'll help you understand what's happening in the church today. Number one, we look at a child's life, birth to 18 years of age. Uh, we know that the spiritual foundation is pretty well set by 13. Barna and several others are saying that that's the point where their faith is set. And so a lot of, and they also say that the kids have left the church, have already left the church by 13 in their hearts. They may be there coming and being brought by their parents, but they've left the church. What's quite significant, according to the studies of Alan, Dr. Alan Nelson, is the 1013 window. At this point, they're saying that this is the most, he's saying that this is the most critical point to teach leadership skills to kids in the church today. All right. Our problem is today, and then we'll, well, let's back up here. This is called the 1013 window. Our problem today is this. And in each church I've talked to, in seminars and webinars and things like that, every church has a leadership void. Well, if you see this flat red line, what this, what this represents is what's happening to the church today. The flat line is standing for on the bank, I do, you watch me, okay? Well, how many churches you go to and your church alone has a huge leadership void, okay? And the problem is we've set kids for 18 years and we have not recognized their gifts We've asked them to sit, be still, be quiet. And so when they hit college or when they become parents, when we go to them and ask them, hey, would you serve in the church? They're shocked. They're surprised. They can't believe that you would ask them to help do something like this. And so what we found out with LIT is we want to apply the Ezekiel principle during these critical times. By the time a child in your church hits 12 years of age in your small group, you start out I do you watch. By the end of the semester, by May, they should be doing everything in your small group. And you can find that out on the uh, Taking Kids into the Spiritual Depths section of your handbook, okay? But I want to leave you with this, and understanding is this is where we're moving kids in LIT because of many factors as their spiritual foundation is being set, their moral development is peaking at this time, this is a critical time to teach leadership skills to kids in the church today. But also, when you apply the Ezekiel principle, we have seen significant transformation in the lives of kids. And many, many, many kids in college today look back to these times in their life in the church. And, and then what we're going to do also in when they hit sixth grade, well, this is another moment for kids to become leaders and disciples. When they hit this point, we allow them to go back and disciple younger kids in the church and watch them. Uh, there's two things that happen. Number one, that sixth grader realizes, hey, I've got to take my faith seriously. I've got to look at my faith differently than I did before. Secondly, the kids connect with that older preteen, and, and, and they want to be like them. And so it's so critical that sixth grader, when they begin, begin discipling, that they're walking with the Lord, okay? And I've heard some... Uh, Junior high and senior high students say, I was a really a lousy LIT. I wasn't doing my quiet time. But when I began to disciple, I realized I had to take my faith seriously. So this is part one. Uh, I encourage you to read through your leadership training guide. 
become very familiar with it because phase one is not where it stops with the Ezekiel principle. That's the beginning point where they, I do, and you'll do it, and you'll model it, and they watch you. And the next phase is you're going to give them a spiritual gift test. Once you know where they're at spiritually, you'll initiate a spiritual gift test. You'll find out what their spiritual gifts are. And then you begin to engage them in your small group uh, according to their gifts. And moving them through the Ezekiel principle, because folks, you don't want them sitting for 12 months or 9 months watching you teach them because you're going to basically kill their faith. And for the, the church becomes meaningless to them. But when you recognize that they have spiritual gifts and your role is to disciple them, but also equip them for works of ministry in the church. Okay. And so when you see kids in your group that have significant gifts, each gift is significant. But when that gift manifests, you see some kid in your group that's a really great teacher. Make sure you tell the director of LIT or your children's pastor so they can think of and create bigger and greater responsibilities for that child. Okay. Well, uh, if you have any questions, be sure to go to our website. There's a lot of extra training ideas. If you'll go to leadersintraining.com and you click the training tab and you'll see a whole list of videos you can watch to continue to train and to better understand the ministry of LIT. Have a great day.